Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, the text, as you know, is from 1 Samuel 12, and I would invite you to keep your Bibles open and look at that uh, and follow along as I say a few things about it this morning. I guess the first thing I should do is try to explain to you why I chose such a marginal and convoluted story to preach into your life this morning. Basically, the reason is that I like the fireworks that Samuel displays. Now, that may be kind of a cheesy metaphor to use on the 4th of July weekend, I know, but it's sort of true, because I think that Samuel preaches a very powerful sermon, and he makes some gutsy moves that I really admire. But Samuel's sermon does more than evoke my admiration. It also gets me thinking about the relationship between preaching and power. It gets me to ask myself just how I negotiate this gap between Samuel and myself and between his preaching and mine. And also between his ancient hearers and you with your modern ears. In Samuel's sermon, where is the power actually to be found? And where is it to be found in my sermons? So as I look a little more closely with you at Samuel's sermon this morning, I hope I can show you my answers to those questions and perhaps reshape your perspective a little bit on preachers and power. Now notice right from the start that Samuel is not at all afraid to challenge the people, which for many pastors is a gutsy move in and of itself. He makes no attempt to hide his anger at their foolish insistence that they need a king. Their request disrespected Samuel, whom the Lord had chosen to be their leader for so many years, and of course, it disrespected God himself. Samuel immediately puts the people on the defensive. Look at how he uses language that you usually hear in a court of law, as if the people are on trial. Testify against me, he says a couple of times. What have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? The people are forced to admit the truth. The Lord is a witness. You have done none of these things. And the unasked question hangs heavy in the air. Then why the heck do you need a king? Then starting at verse 7, notice, Samuel presses his case. Verse 7 should really be translated like this. So now, take your stand, and I will go to court with you in the presence of the Lord over all the Lord's life-saving actions that he has done for you and for your fathers. You see, now he's not asking them to testify against him. He's asking them to stand in the presence of God himself and testify against God. In the next few verses, Sam, Samuel lays out the damning evidence. He reviews the congregation's past history with God by reminding them that whenever they were in trouble, God sent someone to deliver them. Even when they were faithless, God was faithful. But now in this present situation, the Ammonites threatened them. And rather than trusting in God and Samuel, the people insisted on having a king. Even when the Lord God himself was your king, Samuel accuses them. Israel just did not trust God to do for them what he said he would do. They underestimated the power of the Almighty God. And they wanted to be like everyone else around them. Nevertheless, as you know, God gave them a king. But that didn't mean that Samuel was no longer angry with them, and it didn't mean that God was all smiles either. Lest the people fail to see how wicked they really were and how close to death they were getting, notice that Samuel provides this visual aid. He tells them, he tells them in advance, remember, that he's going to ask God to send some thunder and rain on their wheat harvest so that they might know, get this, so that they might know how great is their wickedness. Now that's a gutsy move 
to make. It is as if Samuel said, you don't think God's angry at you? Well, think again. So Samuel stops his sermon for a moment to pray that prayer. He prays it, and just like that, God sends the thunder and rain as Samuel requested. Don't miss the point. God did what Samuel said. You see, that's a powerful sermon that I admire and I have to say I envy a little bit. The word of the prophet just is the word of God. And it is a mistake, a very bad mistake to think otherwise. Standing in the midst of the storm, Israel trembled under the terrible wrath of God and his prophet. The thunder and rain announced God's verdict. Guilty as charged. Now think about this. All Samuel had to do was deliver the final sentence. The people had no defense. They couldn't argue their way out of this. Samuel only had to say the word, and God would do what he said. The people had just seen that, and they knew that Samuel was really angry. Again, that does not bode well for the people. Samuel's preaching had quite literally brought that congregation to their knees, where the only thing they could do is beg for their lives. So that's what they do. Pray for your servants to the Lord your God that we may not die, they cry. For we have added to all our sins this evil, to ask for ourselves a king. You see, Samuel's sermon had turned this proud, stubborn people into beggars. Now that's power. So, what does Samuel do with all the power at his command? Well, it is this part of the story that I find so interesting. There is a shift in Samuel's rhetoric, and it is so subtle that it is easy to miss the grandeur of the moment. At that very point that the people are the most terrified, because Samuel had done everything in the entire sermon to make them terrified. Samuel takes it all back. He says, don't be afraid. What? Don't be afraid. Then he says, you have done all this evil, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn after empty things that cannot profit or deliver, for they are empty. And then he says, Certainly the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. Samuel had just finished showing the congregation how displeased God was with them. Now he is telling them how pleased he is to make them a people for himself, and he is promising that he won't forsake them. Now notice that this word is not accompanied by some powerful sign or impressive display. And so it would be easy to think that this word lacks the power of the rest of the sermon, that it is somehow less true or less certain. But I think those are the most powerful words in the sermon, and certainly the most beautiful. Don't be afraid. Certainly the Lord will not forsake his people. It has pleased the Lord to make you a people for himself. It's the sort of thing you would never hear in a court of law because the penalty doesn't fit the crime. It's not a punishment or a command that the people hear, but a promise. God delights in these wicked people and promises that he will not forsake them. That's his decision. Now you see, this shift in Samuel's speech reminds me of Elijah's experience on Mount Horeb. There was the wind, there was the earthquake, there was the fire. And then remember, there was that still, small voice. And there was God in all his power. So here, after the rain and after the thunder, think of Samuel's words as that still, small voice of God. And there is God in all his power. This is a simple promise from God through Samuel to the people. And think about this. It is powerful enough to overcome 
all of the sin and evil of those people and to turn away the very wrath of God himself. That's the power of the promise. It is the wonder and beauty of God that at their judgment day, the last thing that Israel heard was not judgment or condemnation, but this word of salvation. I guess the more I read this sermon, the more I like the asymmetry of those two preached words. After all those the rhetorical pyrotechnics, the weighty verbiage, the terrifying sign, the expression of God's wrath, the feelings of terror and guilt and sin and imminent death, it's all turned away by Samuel's, don't be afraid. You have done all this evil. And then the promise outside of the law that God would not forsake them and that he was pleased to make them his people anyway. And that still small voice changes everything. It's a lovely reminder of the power of God's promise that we hear from the mouth of simple preachers. Compare this story with that moment when we all stand in the presence of God and confess our sins. Like this ancient congregation, don't we stand before God here as proud people who have been reduced to beggars? Don't we confess that we are poor, miserable sinners who deserve nothing but temporal and eternal punishment? Don't all of us deep down in our hearts know what we deserve? And yet from the lips of a preacher, we don't hear what we deserve. In the stead and by, by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. You see, that judgment doesn't fit the crime. We hear a promise, not an indictment, not a punishment. God lets us off the hook. It's the same thing in Holy Communion. Don't we all come to the table as poor, miserable sinners, knowing in our hearts what we deserve? And instead, what do we hear from God? Take and eat Jesus' body and blood given for you. Why? For the forgiveness of your sins. In these words, you discover that God delights in you too and that he will not forsake you either. Where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also and always life and salvation. And that is a promise that God will not break for you. You know, all around us, we hear powerful voices of threat and judgment and anger and fear. The rhetoric can be overwhelming. People and experiences making us feel small, telling us all the time that we are worthless. In the midst of all this powerful and condemning language comes this simple word of promise from the lips of a preacher. And wonder of wonders, it is in this word that God has put his mighty power to save us and to overcome all those other condemning voices in our lives, even God's. Personally, I am very thankful for the asymmetry of these two preached words that Samuel delivers to us. And I look for it not only in the worship service, but in my daily life as well. <clears throat> when my whole day seems to be a mess and evil surrounds me and sin seems to well up from the dark places in my heart, quite frankly. I look for that word of grace, the words, I forgive you. And I never fail to marvel at the healing power that those words from God have for my aching heart. And the power they have to change the course of my life, my destiny, and yours as well. Amen.